And it really is as easy as that to make a cup of herbal tea. Now, I'll admit, lemon balm, peppermint, chocolate mint, the entire mint family, they are thugs in the garden. You do have to keep an eye on them because they will take over a patch if you let them. So keeping them in pots or constrained in some way is the way to go. But you can't beat going out first thing in the morning and picking some fresh herbs and making yourself a nice warm cuppa. And I showed the ladies on Minx Radio exactly that very thing this week. And that is an important announcement that I have to make. So I've started doing a radio spot on our national radio station. And once a month I'll be joining the Late Lunch Show for an entire hour of gardening. And we kicked it off this week. And the gals came up here to the allotment garden and I showed them how to make tea and showed them around the allotment and also showed them a tip on how to keep supermarket basil alive. And I've created a playlist on my channel, so if you want to watch the show, it's over there. So they have it on YouTube, on Facebook, as well as being on the air. And I'll be doing that every month now. And I'll be visiting some local places as well, so I've got some exciting field trips lined up. And back at the allotment garden this morning, made myself some tea. I've got some things on the agenda that need to get done, so I've got some purple sprouting broccoli to pick. I'm going to pick some early edible flowers for my Easter dessert. And then I thought that we could have a wander around the allotment, my plot as well as the other plots, to see what's growing, to see what people have been up to, and to get some inspiration for our early spring gardening. So let me finish this cuppa, because that's important, and then we'll go have a look. something that surprised me recently. I heard that people in North America are not really that familiar with purple sprouting broccoli. Sure, everyone is familiar with the green calabrese, so the, the normal green broccoli that you get at the supermarket, but these purple sprouting varieties that sprout in early spring are less common. And it makes me think that they must be a British type of vegetable. The difference between the two is flavor. So purple sprouting is a lot deeper and more earthier in flavor. The color is obviously different, although when you cook it, it does turn green or a bit darker. Definitely not purple anymore. And they take a lot longer to crop than ordinary Calabrese broccoli. So summer broccoli, you sow it in the early part of the year and you harvest it in the summer. Whereas purple sprouting, you sow it in spring, or up to late spring actually, and then plant it out. It grows through the year, and then the following year, so from February at the earliest, I imagine, end of January, February, until about now, you get these beautiful spheres of broccoli. Absolutely delicious, well worth the investment in time. And they crop at a time when very little else is in the garden. And for that reason alone, I would highly recommend getting hold of some seed, no matter where you are in the world. They do very well in temperate climates though, so you probably won't be able to grow these in places like Africa or uh, warmer parts of Asia. But if your climate is suitable, definitely add purple sprouting broccoli to your vegetable garden to grow list. There's a sycamore tree just above here and it is humming with honeybees, which reminds me that just yesterday I went and visited my honeybees. It's warm enough to really open up the hives and have a real good look inside. And the bees have done well through the winter. They had plenty of stores, they're making new honey and I've given them extra space now. So they've got supers on each of them that they can continue building up their honey stores. I've taken out their entrance blocks and the varroa floors which 
I really just use to keep the colonies warm. We don't have Varroa here on the Isle of Man. And I took the wood shavings off the top as well, and that was an insulating layer. And if you're interested in honeybees, I've got a playlist with more beekeeping videos, although I do focus mainly on gardening here on my channel now. So this bed here, this last year was my herb bed. So I had chamomile growing here, mints, calendula, dill, everything. There's still quite a few bits and bobs here at the side. And I was thinking about actually creating more space for vegetables here and moving more of my herbs home. Saying that, I will have lots of herbs at home, especially on the patio this year, but I will continue to grow uh, various perennial herbs here and also the really tall ones and large ones that I don't have space for at home. Along here on the left hand side, I have two rows of chamomile growing. These I didn't actually sow from seed myself. They self sowed from the chamomile last year into the pathway here. And so I've transplanted them here in the hopes that they'll perk up and give me a, a new crop of chamomile. It was pretty much zero efforts. Just to the side of them though, I've drawn this drill and I'm going to be sowing some radishes. Most of my veg, I start off in modules at home and then move them out to the garden. And in that way, I save on seeds. I can keep a closer eye on them. Slugs don't decimate them as much. And that's one of the best ways I would say to start off seeds. You can start off practically anything in modules at home. Even some things that they say you can't, like peas. Uh, if you have long root trainers or grow them in toilet paper rolls, you can still move them out. Or, as I'm doing again this year, I'm growing my peas in a gutter and then those will slide out into the ground when the peas are big enough. But some things really do need to be sown direct in the soil and radishes are one of those crops. A couple years ago, I got these seeds in Portugal and they are a variety called Ro Roja Punta Blanca. Radishes are a quick crop, so I'll be able to get my first radishes out of this in about a month's time. And it's perfect for just in here before the, the chamomile starts growing and taking over the spot. So with my garden tasks done for the morning, it's time to have a look at the plot. I'll tell you a little bit of what I've been doing and what I've been doing also at home to prepare the allotment garden. And then let's have a wander around the site and see what everyone else has been up to. Coming up on my plot, you can see that the raspberries are up. Raspberry leaf also makes a really nice tea. It's a woman's herb. And these guys are going to get quite tall and the supports that I put in are really rickety. So I'm going to have to create a new structure this year. Something that will keep them constrained, probably about a meter tall and then go all the way around. The strawberry bed has some new residents as well. I have some mulling, some tenerary strawberry plants still at home in the greenhouse but I rather spontaneously bought some strawberry plants at the garden center and there are two types here and they are I'm probably saying that wrong Honoi Honoi and El Santa back there and then over here on the left those are the Mara de Bois coming back up over here that mess over there that's where the pine berries are and these are the oldest plants here in the bed and they're already starting to flower. A lot of my beds look a bit bare and that's because I'm growing seedlings on at home in the greenhouse and they will be going out here shortly. I have a, a structure here in the center and this is where I've planted my no-dig potatoes and they are underneath those mounds of compost and manure there and I have a couple of varieties I have a first early, which is Pentland Javelin, and then I also have a second early that is the Apache, and that's the one 
that I selected from Thompson and Morgan last year. And we have a problem, a unique problem here at our site, and that is pheasants. And in early spring, there's not much for them to eat. And so they will dig up your seed potatoes. And I've already found evidence this year of them digging. So I've built this very simple contraption, this cage out of old bamboo and string and some netting. And this should do the trick in keeping them out. The plot is really looking tidy and it's ready to be planted up. It will be overflowing in green in no time. Now over here, on my new plot, which is still very much a work in progress, I have the garlic and shallots and onions all planted here and they're in desperate need of some weeding. So that is something that needs to be done this coming week. And I've also noticed that I've had some pheasant damage over here as well. So you can see they've been digging around the onions and they've caused some damage. You can see just down here one of the red onions is exposed. So let's push that back. In the winter I showed you how I pruned the thornless blackberries and you can see now a lot better how they've been all fanned out on the wires. And doing that really encourages growth, but also air circulation, and it will make it a lot easier to pick berries as well. Now on to looking at some other plots. This plot holder here on the left has put in a lot of work yesterday, and I spoke to him about it. And he put in a lot of these wooden frames around his beds and brought in some compost and then also put wood chips down on his pathways as well. And it looks like a blank slate ready for some summer crops to go in. A lot of work has gone into this plot and they've built structures around the sides with netting to keep the pheasants out. And they had some really healthy crops last year. And it looks like from the state of that well-rotted manure that this year will be much the same. There's some netting there in a roll waiting to go over this, it looks like. And this here, this is a globe artichoke and they grow really well here at our site. I think a lot of people kind of associate them with maybe France or warmer climates, but they will live and produce for about eight years before needing to be replaced and they're really fuss free. And if you like globe artichokes, this is the way to go, grow your own. The site is just alive with birdsong. When we first started, this was just a grassy field and I don't remember hearing any birds that first year. And then over time, as we've cultivated it, it's created places for them to come down and hide and, you know, places for them to feed as well. And it's just so lovely hearing that sound. It's never a bad idea to grow some flowers, growing whatever you'd like, especially if they're also liked by the native insect population. Look at this butterfly. Hello. <laughs> I have quite a few flowers on my own plot and it's fantastic that so many other people grow them here as well. It really does support the vegetable garden growing flowers and posies, but also if you grow some that are great for cut flowers as well, then they have a dual purpose. I use the term raised beds a lot when I describe these wooden structures that we use here at Lala, but they're not super raised beds. They're just really about six inches tall, if that, and they're great for filling with compost or in this plot's case they use a lot of seaweed. You can see it down here around the onions that they've planted. And the wooden frame just helps to keep the compost in and not erode down the hill. So it's a it's a good idea to have them here even though wooden edges they do attract and create habitat for slugs it's much better i think to have them here on our site 
someone's got their sweet peas in and they're planted at the base of a little wigwam here made with some bamboo canes and string. Sweet peas are an amazing fragrant cut flower. They look beautiful in a cottage garden setting. And over there on the other wigwam are some broad beans. And then the green over there, that looks like perpetual spinach, which is a nice reliable crop that will stand through the winter and give you some early spring greens as well. We're gonna get a little bit closer to the sage because it's incredible. It is 10 years old and I just found out that it was just one of those little tiny plants in like a three inch pot like plopped right into the soil here and it's just been growing away ever since and it's this amazing purple color it smells incredible this is quite a clever idea for growing strawberries so strawberries first of all they send out runners and if you don't want runners then this is the way to do it this will also stop weeding you having to weed and when the berries start fruiting, they will lay directly on the fabric and it will make it easier for picking. Well, that was a lovely tour around the allotment garden in April. I hope you enjoyed it and that you took something from it. Maybe some plants to grow, some crops or ways to grow them in your own garden. As for me, I'm going to be heading home and making that pavlova because it is Easter after all. I hope that you have a fantastic weekend celebrating with your friends and family and thanks for taking the time out to come and visit me during your long weekend. Next week we'll be back visiting the tomatoes. So I have a story about my tomatoes that, that started earlier this year. I've shown how I grew them from seed potted them on and now they are raring to go so we're going to be planting those out in the greenhouse and I'm going to show you how I, I will be doing it this year so tune in again next week for that and until then thank you and bye for now